It is now time for question period. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, during this pre-budget period, we have tried to impress upon you how reckless and dangerous your fiscal and electricity policies really are. Sadly, it seems we're not getting through. I know you have enough staff so that every call and every email to your office is screened by a legion of loyal Liberals. Here in opposition, we often deal, that, deal with those on a personal basis. We hear from constituents in desperate circumstances because their hydro bills are skyrocketing while their incomes are stagnant and the tax burden grows heavier. But this does not seem to matter to you. Ratepayers in this province currently don't know how they're going to pay this month's hydro bill and where will they be in five years when their bills have doubled yet under your failed, disastrous energy policies? Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, I, um, I thank the member opposite for the question, and I would, uh, I would say to him that uh, he knows full well that we have worked very hard to reinvest in and uh, rebuild the energy system in this, uh, in this province, Mr. Speaker. The, uh, the electricity system, when we came into office, was, uh, had been neglected, Mr. Speaker. It was degraded across the province. It was not reliable, and we had to make investments. 10,000 kilometres of line, Mr. Speaker, just as an example, had to, be, uh, had to be rebuilt. So the fact is that that costs money, and the legacy of the party opposite was that they had left that degraded electricity system, Mr. Mr. Speaker. So we've made those investments, and we recognize, Mr. Speaker, that we have to we have to have some support Order. in place for people who need who need some help, Mr. Speaker. So I hope yes, that as the uh, member opposite responds to those emails, that he lets people know about the programs that are in place, and I'll speak Thank to those you. in the supplementary, yeah. Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Yes, she conveniently ignores the $50 billion of global adjustment that people are paying in this province. You keep ignoring the $27 billion debt of the Ontario Electricity Financial Corporation like it doesn't actually exist. Your ignorance in bl is bliss mentality won't make the problem go away. Energy rates have continuously increased since your government came to power in 2003. This devastating trend of escalating rates will only worsen through your sale of Hydro One. If you sell 60 percent of Hydro One, you will restrict the OEFC's ability to pay off the electricity debt. This will result in higher rates for electricity consumers, even higher than your 42 percent planned increase under your long-term energy plan. You're going to, Premier, I ask you this question. Are you going to follow the law in the Electricity Act and use the proceeds, proceeds from the Hydro One sale to pay down the electricity debt? Thank you, Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, so, so the supplementary has gotten to where this uh, member really wants to go, which is he doesn't believe that we should be taking the tough decisions uh, required to invest in infrastructure in this province, Mr. Speaker. That's essentially what he is saying. But let me let me go back to the issue of uh, people who need some support. He knows full well that no matter what we do in terms of Hydro One, the Ontario Energy Board will continue to set rates, Mr. Speaker. The Ontario Energy Board has been setting rates. They will continue continue to set rates, Mr. Speaker, but even in that reality, we know that uh, there are people who need support. So, for example, the Low Income uh, Energy Assistance Program prom provides emergency financial support for families and individuals who are having trouble paying their bills. The Save on Energy Home Assistance Program helps consumers save on energy costs by improving the energy efficiency in their homes, Mr. Speaker. The fact, is, the fact is that we recognize that there are supports necessary. We have programs in place, but we are going to invest Thank in infrastructure, you. Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Those programs are nothing but distractions to take people's attention away from the disasters that you've put upon them. Right. Your rushed announcement to sell Hydro One shows you have no plan to protect ratepayers from further increases. You're motivated by a short-term goal to fund your wish list and in turn have no problem making things worse for electricity consumers, even though they've been hammered since you came to power. You're ignoring the elephant in the room. As rates rise in Ontario and become more and more uncompetitive, you've driven businesses out of the province into the arms of lower-rate jurisdictions and have made electricity unaffordable for the average Minister family. Of Economic Development. It's the ratepayers of this province who have built up the energy assets, like Hydro One. Over the decades, they are the ones who, and they are the ones who need the break today. But you seem determined to double down on your disastrous policies. How much more do the ratepayers of this province have to suffer before you provide real, sustainable energy relief to consumers? Premier. 
Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, the elephant in the room that was in the room when that party was in power was that there needed to be investment in this province. There needed to be investment in the electricity system. There needed to be investment in infrastructure, Mr. Speaker, none of which the opposite. Some of the noise I'm hearing is coming from people who are supposed to be seated elsewhere. Finish, please. None of which the opposite party undertook, Mr. Speaker. We are undertaking those investments. But let me let me continue to uh, uh, make sure that the member opposite understands the programs that are in place. Because if his concern is for people who are struggling, Mr. Speaker, he will want to know about these. So, as he knows, currently the Ontario Clean Energy Benefit, which is a 10% discount for uh, residential consumers and small businesses and farms, is in place, Mr. Speaker. Um, what I'm, I hope he's aware of is that the new Ontario Electricity Support Program um, will come into effect, Mr. Speaker, when yes, the OECB expires, and that provides targeted support for low-income families, Mr. Speaker. I hope he's aware of that and he lets his constituents know, Mr. Speaker. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. I, I beg for your indulgence because I've just been handed a note. The uh, um, there's a, another guest that has been inadvertently missed, uh, Louise Russo, in the Speaker's Gallery, who was shot and recovered from a violent crime, so we welcome you to the, the House today. Apologize to the members. I thought it was important. So we now have new questions. The member from the PN Carlton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And yes, the delay I think was necessary. That was important. Uh, my question is to the Premier. On April 20th, regarding power rates, you said the way that rates are set by the OEB, that's how they're set now, and that's how we will set them in the future. Those protections are in place. Yet, on that same day, the OEB announced a 15 per cent increase, and now consumers will be paying twice as much on peak. My definition and the Premier's definition of consumer protection are miles apart. In fact, she hasn't sold a Remember single from Prince share Hastings, of Hydro One yet, the but prices are going up, making it more difficult for Ontario families. Will the Premier tell this Assembly right now what her Sale of hydro Please finish. Will the Premier tell us right now what her sale of Hydro One will cost Ontario ratepayers and what it will cost Ontario families and what it will cost Ontario seniors? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I think the, uh, the member opposite made one of the points that I want to make, Mr. Speaker, which is these are unrelated subjects. The fact is that the Ontario Energy Board has set rates, and the, uh, we laid out a, a long-term energy plan, Mr. Speaker, and in that we, we, we forecast what the, uh, what the rates were going to be, Mr. Speaker. And the goes both ways. just announced by the OEB are actually lower than what was forecast in the long-term energy plan mr. speaker so the fact is the fact is that we are working very hard to take costs out of the system so that those prices can go down and you know the member opposite references the uh, the off-peak and on-peak uh, uh, prices mr. speaker yeah we want to drive we want to drive conservation mr. speaker I know I know that the uh, party opposite has not the slightest bit of interest in in, uh, in uh, conservation, Mr. Speaker, or environmental concerns. They have no interest in uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Answer. None of that is of interest to them, Mr. Speaker. The fact is, it is of interest to us, and having a, a decent gap between the off peak and on, off -peak, and on peak actually drives conservation. Thank you. The member from, the member from Renfrew come to order. I'm catching up. And the member from Prince Edward Hastings, second. Supplementary. Speaker, that answer wasn't even rational. 
And the Premier knows it because they changed their long-term energy program and their plan several times in the last five years. In fact, the sale of Hydro One wasn't even in it. In fact, it wasn't even in their platform. Electricity rates have tripled three times since her government has come to power in 2003. The OEB continues to raise its rates, and they're going to continue to drive up rates because we have to pay for expensive energy experiments by this government, whether it's industrial wind turbines or whether it is the smart meter Member tax machines. The Minister of now Economic we are going to see Ontario time. families struggle even further off-peak. Why, at a time when Stephen Harper's government is making it easier for Ontario families to survive, is this government making it more difficult? The member from Eglinton Lawrence will come to order. Start the clock. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I would just note that the member opposite couldn't even keep a straight face. The member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke will come to order. Next one's a warning. Mr. Speaker, I would just say that uh, the, uh, even the member opposite couldn't keep a straight face when she was asking that question. Um, the fact is that the, uh, you know, the federal budget, the federal government has made decisions, you know, and that they've made decisions for their political reasons. Uh, they've made decisions that if you're if you're doing fine, if you're wealthy, then we're going to help you to do better. But what they didn't do was they didn't tackle the tough issues that are facing every province in this country, Mr. Speaker. They didn't tackle the infrastructure deficit, Mr. Speaker. They didn't tackle the fiscal imbalance. They didn't look at the communities in this in this country and say, we're going to work with you to make sure that you have an economic future, and we're going to support you in that economic development. They didn't do any of that, Mr. Speaker. They just said, if you're rich, we're going to help you get richer. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Attorney General, come to order. I'm not sure who said that, but I would appreciate immensely if the member would stand up and withdraw. I'm not asking for editorials either. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. It is hard to keep a straight face around here, given the embarrassment that we're going to see at 4 o'clock this afternoon with a budget that is still in deficit when the federal government can balance their own. But let's get back to the point here. The Premier admitted this week that Hydro said Hydro weights won't go up, but Ed Carson. Minister of Government and Consumer Services, come to order. Carry on. Thanks, Speaker. Minister of Tourism and Culture Ed and Sport. Clark said he can't guarantee that hydro rates won't go up. And as our old friend in this chamber, Dalton McGinty, once said, the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. 
So I think we're in for a doozy of a hydro rate increase. Again, rates have tripled since you've come to power. They're going to spike another 42 percent, going up $100 per family in a household across this province. And just this week, it was announced electricity rates are raising again by another 15 percent in May. Question. Will the Premier come clean and tell us how much her sale of Hydro One is going to cost Ontario families Thank who you. are struggling under her government? Thank you. Please. You seated, please. Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, the, the, um, the budget that we are going to bring forward is going to be a responsible one that is uh, based on the plan that we ran on and that, uh, that we are uh, committed to, and that is investment in this province, Mr. Speaker. And it did include a review of assets, Mr. Speaker. We said we were going to do that. We have done that in order that we can invest in the public transit and the roads and the bridges that are needed all across this province, Mr. Speaker. You know, when the previous— Member from Dufferin the, Cal the, the party opposite was in power, Mr. Mr. Speaker, they had an opportunity to tackle many of these big issues. Yep. They chose not to. They neglected the electricity system, Mr. Speaker, and yeah, they worked toward balancing their budget. And the way they did that, Mr. Speaker, was very similar to what Mr. Harper has done. They balanced their budgets on the backs of municipalities, Mr. Speaker. They downloaded costs to the, the municipalities. Answer. We've uploaded those costs, Mr. Speaker. We're not going to balance our budget on the backs of municipalities or residents, Mr. Speaker. But that's exactly what Stephen Harper. You see it, please. Thank you. New question. The member from Bramley Gorham. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last April, the Premier, the Premier made a promise to Ontarians. She said, and I quote, she would not cut education. Well, we've seen teachers fired, schools closed and families thrown into chaos. In fact, just last week, Windsor families saw and learned that 21 early childhood educators were being fired. People didn't vote to see their schools closed and teachers fired. Will today's budget reverse these cuts? Well, Mr. Sure. Speaker, and I know the Minister of Education is going to want to speak to the specifics, but let's just be clear, Mr. Speaker, the funding for education has not been cut. No, it no. will not be cut, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, in fact, if the, uh, the member opposite uh, had an opportunity to look at the Grants for Student Needs, which is actually the section of the budget that applies to, uh, to education, those numbers are already in the public realm, Mr. Speaker, he would see that despite the fact that there are fewer students in our education system, Mr. Speaker, the funding has remained stable, which in fact means that there is more money per student in the system, Mr. Speaker, this year than last year. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In fact, the Premier made another promise. She said she would not cut health care. Yet, uh, I would ask the Premier to tell that to the 17 RNs who were fired from South Lake Regional Health Centre, the 50 nurses fired in Ottawa, the 11 nurses that are being fired in Thunder Bay, and to the seniors who are losing 28 beds in that region. Ontarians didn't vote to see nurses fired or hospitals closed. Will today's budget reverse those cuts? Good question. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Oh. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, I mean, the member opposite, I mean, that whole caucus knows that the truth is that there are 24,000 more nurses employed in this province than were a decade ago. And we continue to employ nurses and other health care professionals. My critic, of course, the member from Nickel Belt yesterday, uh, scared the heck out of a lot of people when she said the Lake Ridge Health Centre was letting go of 20 percent of their genetic technologists, laying off senior technologists. These positions, she said, have a direct impact on the patients at Durham. The truth, in fact, is the complete opposite of what she said. And in fact, the hospital in question was so irritated by her response in the legislature yesterday. They're issuing a letter today to correct the record. She's talking for herself. I hope, Mr. Speaker, answer. I hope I have the opportunity in the supplementary to actually address this more specifically. Yes. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Ontario drivers pay the highest. I would like order, please. Start the clock. Final supplementary. 
Ontario drivers pay the highest auto insurance rates in Canada. The Premier told Ontarians that they would see a 15 per cent reduction in auto insurance by this August. But with four months to go, the Premier is not even halfway there. The Premier promised not to cut health care, but we've seen nurses being fired and hospitals being closed. The Premier promised not to cut education, but we see teachers being fired and schools being closed. The Premier promised to reduce auto insurance by 15 per cent. Yet we've not seen that yet. Stop, stop. Associate Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, the member from Newmarket Aurora, um, and I probably got four more that I'm going to come and get you. That's enough. Please finish. The Premier promised to provide a 15 per cent reduction to auto insurance. Will today's budget ensure that Ontarians get the, get the reduction that they were promised? Yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, I'm prepared to go through this one hospital at a time if they want to. I'm going to give the member the opportunity as well to correct his record when he said we're closing hospitals. There's not a single hospital that's closing around this province unless we're building a new one to replace it, Mr. Speaker. Back to, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, back to Lake Ridge Hospital. She was talking about three people. The hospital has said they disagree that patients will be impacted. In fact, they said technology has changed. They now use University Health Network Lab for better tests and faster results and better quality. All three still have jobs. I, uh, from your own side, I want to hear the, the answer. And from this side, the member from Dufferin Caledon will come to order. Final question. And the Minister of uh, Aboriginal Affairs uh, is warned. The injections are not appreciated. And I thank the member. I thank the member for the correction. Very helpful. <coughs> New question. Member from Kitchener Waterloo. Premier, um, Mr. Speaker. Many Ontarians are still trying to remember when they voted to sell off Hydro One. Mm -hmm. The Premier made lots of promises during the last election. She promised 15-minute all-day go rail service to Kitchener. She broke that promise last Friday. But she never said anything about selling off Ontario's oldest and most valuable public asset. She never made that promise, Mr. Speaker. That was an election promise from the Common Sense Revolution. We're lucky that the Ontario public forced Mike Harris to break that promise. Mr. Speaker, why is the Premier breaking her promise to run a progressive gov government while keeping an election promise from the Common Sense Revolution? <laughs> well, Mr. Speaker, you know, um, making decisions like the investment in transit and transportation infrastructure, the magnitude uh, that we are, Mr. Speaker, are very important decisions because they, they are decisions that are, gonna, that are going to have an impact for generations to come. The member opposite knows full well that we are committed to 15-minute full-day two-way go service, Mr. Speaker. She also knows that there are sections of line around the, uh, the province, and I know the Minister of Transportation will want to speak to this, where we have to negotiate with CNCP and we have to make sure that we can uh, we can move forward but mr speaker the fact is we did run on reviewing assets we said that part of our plan to invest in the infrastructure the roads and the bridges that are needed around this province would be that we would look at assets that had been built up by this province mr speaker and owned by the people of ontario and we would leverage those the member from dufferin calendar is warned carry on in order to invest in new assets. We, and we would retain ownership, Mr. Speaker, which is exactly what we're doing. We're retaining ownership of Hydro One, Mr. Speaker, broadening that ownership, but we will, we will make sure that we make those investments that we committed to, Mr. Speaker. Again to the Premier. Over the last few years, Hydro One's profits have gone up. Meanwhile, interest rates have gone down, and yet Deputy the House Premier Leader. thinks it makes more sense to give up those rising profits instead of taking advantage of falling interest rates. It's just not fiscally responsible. For every dollar in interest the government would save by selling Hydro One, Ontarians will give up $2 in Hydro One profits, lost profits. Mr. Premier, does the Premier realize that two is bigger than one? Well, Mr. Speaker, what, what we know is that, uh, contrary to what the, uh, the uh, third party would uh, like to suggest, we cannot just keep borrowing to make these investments, Mr. Speaker. We have to, at some point, at some point we have to have the, 
the money in hand to be able to make it. Finish, please. So, Mr. Speaker, I, you know, the fact is that we ran on a plan to make the investments that we know are needed in terms, to, in terms of uh, our economy, Florida. Mr. Speaker. That means transit in, and uh, roads and bridges, Mr. Speaker. It means within the Greater Toronto-Hamilton area. It means outside the Greater Toronto-Hamilton area, Mr. Speaker. We know that companies want to come to Ontario, but they are not going to come if we don't have the infrastructure that will allow us to be competitive in the 21st century. So that's why we're going to make these investments, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Thank you again to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, the Premier's fire sale of Hydro One will mean giving away hundreds of millions of dollars in annual profits to Bay Street. Once you sell it, it is gone, gone, gone. The Premier says this money will go to infrastructure, and just like the Harper government, the Premier wants these to be public-private partnerships. The Auditor General found that uh, of the $8 billion that the government wasted on public-private partnerships, $6.5 billion of this went to the pockets of Bay Street financiers. So the, the Minister of Economic Development is uh, warned. Finish, please. $6.5 billion of this went into the pockets of Bay Street financiers. So the government will sell Hydro One to Bay Street in order to pay for P3s that benefit Bay Street. Minister Mr. Speaker, Jones, when did the government decide to sell the province of Ontario Question. to Bay Street? Well, Mr. Speaker, what the, what the member opposite neglects to mention is that uh, because of the because of the strategy that we undertook to get the infrastructure built, Mr. Speaker, we actually saved eight billion dollars in terms of the risk that we possibly could have spent, Mr. Speaker. And I want to just I want to just be clear that the uh, you know the, the party opposite also has not made it clear and has uh, neglected to. Rem the member from Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke is warned. Carry on. I think there's a budget this afternoon, so if anyone wants to test. I will name. The, the third party has neglected to mention, Mr. Speaker, that in, uh, in the plan that, uh, that Ed Clark brought forward, we've made it clear that the government will retain control, Mr. Speaker. Yes. Uh, our government's been clear that uh, broadening the ownership of uh, Hydro One, retaining 40 per cent ownership, Mr. Speaker, Ontario will, retain, will remain the Answer. largest shareholder. No other entity will be able to own more than 10 per cent, Mr. Speaker, and we will have control over the board and the, uh, and the chair, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Those protections are in place. Thank you. New question, the member from Simple North. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Education. Uh, Minister, students are, out, are still out of the class in, in, in Durham. It's her fourth day, uh, and already we're getting a number of emails and letters and phone calls to our offices. Uh, no one is buying your excuse that these strikes are local. Minister, to the Speaker and to the Minister, there's simply no negotiations taking place at the local level. Students in Sudbury will be locked out on April the 27th and in Peel on May the 4th. So that's 71,000 students across this province. Minister, have you been given a coherent explanation yet, or do you now realize the strike is because of years and years of Liberal mismanagement? Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes, what, what I'm pleased to report is, is what I've been able to report for the last few days is that at the central table that uh, the school board associations representing the employer, the government representing the funder, and uh, the unions representing the uh, secondary teachers in the English public system are all at the table. We all continue to uh, work on negotiations because I think we all share the belief that the way to resolve this situation is uh, to reach a negotiated collective yeah. agreement. None of us want to see those students missing class. We all think that we need to get the students back into class as quickly as possible. And the way to do that, Speaker, is to negotiate Answer. a collective agreement. And that's what we are working on at the central level Thank very you. hard right now. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And back to the minister. So, in four days, high school students are expected to see picket lines in Sudbury, and 11 days after that, in Peel. 
That's four days for your staff to ensure that you aren't mystified or perplexed when another board walks away from the table. And I said before, there are no neg negotiations taking place at the local level. When you changed the bargaining system, you said, and I quote, it's quite clear now that the government has, has a requirement to bargain in good faith, end of quote. Minister, if it's so clear, then why don't you know what is keeping students out of the classroom and cancelling proms and field trips? Actually, the, the, the members got his facts wrong because uh, negotiations are ongoing in Rainbow and Peel. In fact, they've actually asked for a mediator from the Minister of Labour uh, in each case to help support those. But, Speaker, I'm not going to take a lecture on how we have managed education centrally from the party that, as part of its platform, committed to, uh, to firing 22 thousand education workers, including thousands of teachers. I mean, that was the way they thought they would manage the education system. That was going to make for great la labor relations when they arrived on the scene and decided to fire everybody. I, I quote from uh, the PC campaign and the leader of the day. Uh, Mr. Hudak was asked when he was leader during the campaign, Will, Thank you. will it mean fewer? Thank you. New question. A reminder when I stand, Minister, you sit. New question. Member from Welland. Speaker, uh, my question is to the Premier. In my riding of Welland and across Hamilton, Niagara, Haldeman, and Brant, members of OPSU 294 have been on strike since April the 10th. The for profit care partners has shown no respect for frontline nurses and refuses to bargain. The CCAC for-profit contracting out is yet another example of this government's right-wing austerity and privatization agenda. It's obvious the for-profit system is not working in health care. It hasn't for years, and it's clear the Premier has no intention of changing the system. Speaker, has the Premier been too busy selling off our public assets to ensure that health care workers working for for-profit agencies are treated with respect and dignity? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, it's, uh, it's of utmost importance to this government that we respect our health care workers. The uh, more than 100,000, well over 100, hundreds of thousands of health care workers around this province that do important work each and every day, including, as the member is referring to, uh, within our home and community care system, but also uh, in our hospital system. That's why that respect and dignity that we afford to those uh, uh, important frontline workers that uh, uh, we're continuing to invest in that important sector of this economy and of a service that's so important to Ontarians. Our investments in home care this year have gone up by 5 per cent. That's a $270 million increase. And a significant portion of that, I should add, is specific to our personal support workers that are so essential across all healthcare yeah. environments, but particularly in the home and, and community sector. And where we've made a commitment to them to increase their wage to a minimum of $16.50. We're giving them a $4 increase over a three-year uh, period. Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Supplementary. Speaker, this past week I've received countless emails from constituents who see the striking health workers not only as nurses but as family. Denise Flanagan has been a patient of Care Partners for six years. She says without the nurses, she would be a young, immobile woman in a convalescent home, wasting away without interaction with others. And these nurses have given her a second, a third, a fourth, and a forever chance at her life. Speaker, it's clear that patient care is being directly impacted because of care partners' failure to bargain, let alone bargain in good faith. These are taxpayers' dollars, and they should be spent on care, not profit. Speaker, why is this Liberal government doing nothing to make sure that these for-profit health care agencies <coughs> respect the bargaining process, work in harmony with frontline workers, to ensure that the 1,600 patients in this area, uh, patients like Denise, continue to receive good quality Question. care that they need. 
Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, the member opposite knows in this particular case we aren't the employers, but we do implore both sides, quite frankly, to uh, negotiate a solution which is respectful of the workers and respectful, most of all, of the uh, individuals, the clients that the member opposite is referencing. And that's why we, uh, uh, in water January of this year as well, I received the report from Gail Donner on home and community care to continue to help us shape the future for that important part of the health care sector. We are making additional investments, 5% this year and an increase of 5% next year and the year after that. So it will be compared to yet last year, it will be almost a three quarters of a billion dollar increase in the budget that goes to home and community care. In this specific example, again, I would just simply implore both parties, the employers, we're not the employers in this case, and the, uh, the employees to negotiate a, a, a solution which is respectful to all parties. Thank you. New question? The member from Kit uh, Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. As the member for Kitchener Centre, I can tell you that public transit is a very important issue to people living in my community. Yeah. Last week, our government announced that we are going to be unlocking assets by offering shares in certain public assets so that we can invest in transit and transportation across the province. And on Friday, the Minister of Transportation and the Premier, Kathleen Wynne, announced plans for regional express rail. These are very exciting announcements, Mr. Speaker, but people living in my community want to know exactly how these investments are going to benefit them. Can the minister please provide clarity, as there seem to be some members member from who are Hamilton East, Stony Creek, come to order. as to how these investments are going to help my constituents living in Kitchener and all the Waterloo region? Thanks very much, Speaker. I want to begin by thanking the member for Kitchener Centre not only for the question today, but for her championing her community for being such a strong advocate, Speaker. <laughs> Speaker, as everyone knows, our government is making the single largest infrastructure investment in Ontario's history through the Moving Ontario Forward Plan. This plan will invest $13.5 billion in improvements across the GO Transit network to increase ridership and reduce travel times, which will result in more than a doubling of peak service and a quadrupling of off-peak service compared to today, and reduced journey times for some cross-region transit trips by as much as 50 per cent. On the Kitchener line alone, Speaker, GO service will increase to more than 10 times current service levels, and in addition, those living between Kitchener and Bramalee will benefit from express service to and from Union Station on the Kitchener line. We will continue to work with CN, who owns a portion of the Kitchener line, to find ways to make commuting faster Thank for you. those living in Kitchener. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for his answer. It is encouraging to hear that people living in my community can expect to see increased GO Rail service through the Moving Ontario Forward Plan. And as the Minister of Transportation noted, we are making the single largest infrastructure investment in Ontario's history. But there are still critics who are suggesting that our government is not doing enough to invest in transit, in transportation in Waterloo Region. Can the minister please tell members of this House what other investments our government is making in transit and transportation in Waterloo Region? Minister. Here again, I thank that member for her question. Speaker, I fundamentally disagree with anyone who suggests that we are not investing in transit and transportation in Kitchener-Waterloo. And Speaker, just look at some of the incredible projects we have underway in that important region. The initial phase of design is already being completed for the expansion of Highway 7 between Kitchener and Guelph, and construction is set to begin in 2015. We've also committed up to $300 million in funding for Stage 1 of Waterloo's rapid transit system. By 2016, Speaker, we will also add two additional morning and afternoon peak period trips between Waterloo Region and GTA on the GO service. We are making critical investments in Kitchener Transit, Speaker. And for members of the opposing parties, the member from Kitchener-Conestoga and the member from Kitchener-Waterloo, they should remember that when they had the chance in 2012 yes, and 2013 and 2014, they and their parties voted against every single budget to deliver for their communities. Thanks. Thank you. You seated, please. You seated, please. Thank you. New question. The member from Leeds Grenville. Uh, thanks uh, very much, Speaker. My question is to the uh, the Premier. Uh, the people of Leeds Grenville have seen your beer sales plan 
and it's left them with a bit of a hangover. Oh, I guess so. They know you can't manage it, and it's just an attempt to distract people from your disastrous Hydro One sell-off and your inability to manage our economy. But what they're most upset is, is that rural Ontario has been left empty-handed with your half-baked plan. But true to form, though, you haven't missed an opportunity to tax us. Premier, why are the people of my riding good enough to pay your $100 million beer tax, but get none of your 450 licenses? Well, Mr. Speaker, um, and I, uh, I would just say to the member opposite, I think he knows that there were inherent unfairness. Uh, there was inherent unfairness in the uh, the model of the beer store that had had evolved over time, Mr. Speaker. And as as Ed Clark looked at the assets uh, in this province and realized that you know there that uh, inherent unfairness could be addressed, craft brewers, for example, Mr. Speaker, around the province were telling us repeatedly that they couldn't get access to shelf space, Mr. Speaker, that they couldn't grow their market share. So the changes that Ed Clark has proposed and that we are adopting will address some of the, that unfairness. But Mr. Speaker, what we know is that in some small towns and rural communities, uh, if there is a grocery store and a beer store, Mr. Speaker, and an LCBO or an agency store, Mr. Speaker, that that distribution network is working quite well for those communities, yes, Mr. Speaker. And what we don't want to do is set up a situation where actually the grocery store, a grocery store in a community, or a beer store would shut down, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. Premier, you know the fact is none of your licenses are going to communities under 30,000 in population. You know that that cap shuts out my entire riding and most of rural Ontario. That means an innovative grocer like Neil Kudrinko in Westport can expand and hire new staff. Not because he doesn't have the ability, but because you say his store is located in the wrong part of Ontario. It's the same thing for Lynn Lamming at uh, Kitley Grocery in Toledo. You're picking winners and losers based on geography. That's wrong. And if you were truly the premier for all of Ontario, you'd make sure that in this afternoon's budget, you would change that 30,000 population cap. Will you do that and allow businesses to compete based on merit? and not their postal code. Well, Mr. Speaker, you know, what the, what the member opposite is saying is that he thinks basically we should just open up the, we should open up the distribution network and beer should be available everywhere, Mr. Speaker. And that just be careful because when when you look at other jurisdictions where that has happened, Mr. Speaker, what you see is the beer price goes up by about five dollars for a two-four, Mr. Speaker. So the fact is, we are trying to find that balance of keeping a distribution network. Thank you. Premier. Speaker, when Ed Clark and his team looked at the distribution network and they looked at the prices in other jurisdictions, Mr. Speaker, what he determined was that if we were to go to some Leeds, of those Grenville jurisdictions and have beer everywhere, Mr. Speaker, the price would go up. So what the Tories are saying is they. I uh, just finished asking the member from Leeds Grenville to come to order, and now he's warned. New question. The member from uh, London, Fanshawe. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. London is home to one of the most of the state of the art and respected medical facilities in the country. Yet Londoners of all ages have contacted my offices, including seniors with mobility issues and limited incomes, telling me they are forced to wait, in some cases for years, for appointments with a medical specialist or told to leave London for that service. Premier. Can you explain why people living right beside a world-class facility are being told they can't have access to it? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite knows that we're making significant investments right across this province, in fact, uh, to bring down the wait times for uh, a whole number of procedures. In fact, for those uh, surgical procedures that we are measuring, uh, we, are, we went from last place when we came uh, into yeah. office in 2003 in to first place uh, yeah. in the entire country. So those investments that we're making and continue to make are paying off, but I know that the 
member opposite will uh, want to uh, acknowledge along with me some uh, important details of an announcement that was made earlier this week that affects uh, her uh, her uh, City of London, uh, which uh, impacts on, in a positive way uh, patient care as well, and I'm happy to speak to that in the yeah, supplementary. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, back to the Premier. Premier, after wasting billions of taxpayer dollars on e-health, orange scandals, and now you are cutting frontline nurse, nursing jobs across the province. It's clear this government is dismantling one of the most respected health care systems in the world piece by piece. Can the Premier explain why all Ontarians, including the most vulnerable se seniors and low-income families, are being further penalized by your inability to safeguard their he health care tax dollars? Thank you. Minister of Health. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh the, uh, we've, you know, in the last decade, in London specifically, we've increased our funding to hospitals by $272 million. And in addition, as I referred to earlier, we've made significant investments as well, almost $100 million in, in investments to bring those wait times down in a significant portion of that in London, and $14 million to the London Health Sciences Centre alone. So we are making those important investments, Mr. Speaker, but I want to reference as well earlier this week where the province approved funding in London for the operation of a new mental the health crisis asked the question, come to order. I know the member opposite is interested Fantastic in this, and this, the head of the Canadian uh, Mental Health uh, Association uh, in Middlesex said this is really great news for folks with mental illness and addictions. It's a 24-hour wa walk-in walk centre that yeah. will provide 10 beds for one to three day Fantastic. stays for people suffering a crisis that don't require hospitalization. Thank you. These are the important investments. That Thank you. No question. The member from Kingston in the island. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Attorney General. As the minister knows, assisting victims of crime with the respect and services they deserve when they need it, the most has all always been a priority for our government. I know this is an important issue for the people in Kingston and the Islands, and I'm proud of the support that this government provides. In light of our guests who have received recognition for their outstanding efforts in victim services, could the Attorney General please enlighten this House on some of the core services that this government provides to victims of crime through the Victim Assistance Crisis Ontario program? Thank you. Attorney General. Mr. Mr. Speaker, let me say a big thank to this a wonderful uh, MPP from Kingston and the island, and I know that she's very, very uh, involved in this very important issue. Our government has been and will continue to be a leader in upholding victims' rights while providing the services they need. Victims in Ontario have timely access to support such as 24-7 in-person crisis intervention at the request of police enhance support for vulnerable victims, including the development and personalized service plan, and referrals to other community support and services when needed. Mr. Speaker, these are just a few examples of exceptional services our government has made available to victims of crime to assist them in their time of need. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, this morning we recognize a group of outstanding individuals involved in frontline care of victims. The Victim Services Awards of Distinction is an annual ceremony in which the Attorney General presents awards to individuals or organizations that have made significant contributions to the provision of victim services in Ontario. I am proud to say that one of the award winners, Pamela Cross, is an accomplished lawyer from my riding who is well known for her deep commitment to improving women's access to justice and for her tireless advocacy for abused women right across this province. Mr. Speaker, could the Attorney General please tell us more about these leaders in victim services? Thank you. Attorney General. Yes, Mr. Speaker, I was very impressed this morning uh, with these uh, people who work days in and days out for victim services. They are our hero in their respective community. This morning, we had these wonderful 15 recipients 
They have been nominated for this award because they raise the profile of victims' issue in Ontario, volunteers countless hours of their time and delivered exceptional services in innovative ways to better serve victims of crime. Mr. Speaker, I was very touched this morning to see a group from, uh, from Sault Ste. Marie who delivered wonderful services last year you know, to the victim uh, families from Elliott Lakes. I was there with them, with them. I saw firsthand how dedicated they are and how important this service is for the victims. So I want to thank them on behalf yes, of sir. the legislature this morning for everything they do and their, everything they have done. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Your question, the member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is the Minister of the Environment. Twice in the House this week, you referenced the apple industry. As you will be aware, the industry has approached your Liberal government many times, and I have written and spoken in this House about the need to initiate an orchard revitalization program, yet we receive nothing more than lip service. The industry is eager to rebuild, to increase export prospects, and in fact to meet your challenge to the ag sector to create 120,000 jobs. The entire industry can be rejuvenated for an investment of $25 million over seven years. Minister, will you do more than spew hot air and ask your government to commit to supporting an investment in apple growers? Well, you know, Mr. Speaker, one of the things about climate change is it is very difficult on farm and farm communities. We know that, which is why we are taking strong measures in Ontario and working with California, Quebec, British Columbia, Manitoba, uh, New York, and many other jurisdictions because we realize that we've got to create better conditions, Mr. Speaker. We also know that the North Americans are going to be more reliant on Ontario food in the future because of the droughts in places like California, which produces 30 per cent of our food. So we have to work very closely with the farm community, which is why the Ontario Federation of Agriculture has endorsed cap-and-trade as an option, because they realize that there are huge opportunities for farm communities in sequestration and in offsets, and they also realize that we've got to act on climate change yes, to sir. protect apple production and other important products in this province. Mr. Thank, Mr. You, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the minister. Minister, enough of the verbal fog. You're quick to find money when it's politically convenient to cover one of your many boondoggles. However, when the apple industry suffered severe production losses, you offered little more than hollow words and platitudes. Minister, if you are sincere, if you really want to make a difference and protect the thousands of jobs in this industry and ensure apples continue to be grown in Ontario, you will do more than exhale, exhale hot air into the atmosphere. Minister, your last budget failed to recognize this important agriculture partner. Can the apple industry count on an investment being included in today's budget to ensure the sustainability of this key agriculture partner and healthy food source, or is it simply more hot air that will save the planet? Uh, we have the Agri-Food Fund, Mr. Speaker, but I want to take a moment here because Don McCabe and the Ontario uh, Federation of Agriculture is on the Minister's Action Group, and they're there for one reason, Mr. Speaker, is that the money that comes to us through our climate strategy has to be reinvested back into things like uh, electrification of public transit, but it also has to go to help farmers and businesses adapt, Mr. Speaker, which is so critical. Um, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite is a member of a party which we cannot understand what their position is on climate change. They seem to have no understanding at all of the risks involved or the damage, Mr. Speaker. Just two days ago, Mr. Speaker, the federal government tabled a budget that had no support for farmers and climate change, that had not a red penny for climate change. I'm also asking the member from here on Bruce and the member from Stormont, Dundas, and South and Gary to come to order, and I've asked you twice. The member from Nickelbelt. Merci, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. The Minister of Health says Deputy that teaching primary care is the front door of our health care system, and I fully agree with him. But our primary care teams are struggling to recruit and retain healthcare professionals, the very people who can open the door for patients. Under the Liberals, compensation in primary care has been kept low and it has been frozen for the last nine years. That means that now one out of five nurse practitioner positions in primary care is sitting empty and patients are forced to work longer for the care they need. In Northern Ontario, the area I represent, the statistics are even worse. 
Will the minister finally act today to attract nurses and healthcare professionals back to primary health care team and give them a reason to stay? Thank you. Minister of Health, welcome to well, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I've had uh, quite a number of conversations with our nurses and the associations that represent them about this specific uh, challenge. And we need to admit it's not just nurses alone, it's other uh, health care practitioners in certain environments. It's an issue uh, of recruitment and retention that I'm looking at. Uh, the ministry is uh, very seriously, it's uh, important uh, to address effectively. But I want to uh, also, I have to go back to the Hansard uh, yesterday, the, the member opposite's claim. Uh, uh, and I I want to be helpful to perhaps help her to correct her own record, where she talked about the claim in Sudbury that Sudbury was cutting 42 positions, Mr. Speaker, and Health Sciences North uh, once again, and I'm happy to go through each hospital just to help the uh, member opposite understand uh, what the truth is. Health Sciences North and Sudbury has confirmed, Mr. Speaker, that no nurses will lose their jobs. And in fact, none of the efficiency measures are Answer. expected to result in nurses being laid off at the hospital. Wow. The hospital statement that they issued yeah. said, I'll continue with this in supplementary. Thank you. The chairman. Our primary care teams are working hard to keep families healthy and patients love them. But this Liberal government is refusing to recognize healthcare professionals for the hard work that they do and refusing to attract new talent to healthcare sector, primary care sector. Ontario nurse practitioner in primary care are the third lowest paid in this entire country. What does that mean? That means that enrollment has also fallen by a third. We will have further problem recruiting. And that means thousands of patients are without the care they should be getting from a primary health care team. Minister, you can fix the problem today. Will the minister act to recruit and retain health care professionals in primary health care team, or will he allow his government to stand back and break yet another promise? Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, before we came into office, there were no nurse practitioner-led clinics. Now we have 25 uh, clinics around the province serving thousands and thousands of Ontarians. But to get back to Health Sciences North that said that it anticipates that no nurses, not the 42 as claimed by the member opposite, no nurses will have to leave the system. There are also an additional 44 vacancies, uh, Mr. Speaker, for registered nurses and registered practical nurses. And uh, to get back to Lake Ridge Hospital, perhaps the member didn't hear, but she, did, she does have the chance to correct her record, of course, calling it a devastating impact on quality of care. In fact, and 20 percent of the staff uh, doing genetics at Lake Ridge being being laid off, according to her. Well, in fact, the hospital has disagreed. Patients will not be impacted. In fact, patient care will be dramatically improved Results because they're using better technology, better tests, faster results, and all three individuals that she's talking about still have jobs, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Labour. Ontario's mining sector directly employs 27,000 Ontarians and supports a further 50,000 jobs through its supply chain and support activities. Our mining sector is the strongest in Canada, with a total production topping $10.7 billion. It's clear that Ontario's mining employers are benefiting greatly from the skills and hard work of the men and women who work in our mines. Minister, in 2013, your ministry convened a mining health, safety and prevention advisory group to review mining practices in the province. Recently, Speaker, the minister was in Sudbury to announce the completion of this advisory group's work. So, will the minister please enlighten this House as to the results of that review? Question. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'd be very, very happy to do that, and thank you to the Honourable Member for that excellent question. I was pleased to be joined recently by the Honourable Member from Sudbury, Ontario's Chief Prevention Officer, and we opened the Mining <coughs> Workplace Health and Safety Conference, and we accepted the final report that was put forward by the Mining Health, Safety and Prevention Advisory Group. This excellent report, Speaker, contains 18 recommendations on how the mining sector can be improved. I'm proud to say that this government accepts each and every one of those recommendations. Some of the final recommendations, employers will have formal management programs in place. Workplaces will enhance ground control protections to track and monitor seismic activity. The ministry will work with employers and labour to conduct regular mining sector risk assessments. 
employers will have plans in place to manage yes, hazards that cause occupational disease. Speaker, this isn't the end of the process. It's part of continuous work that's going to go on to make Ontario's Thank you. mines the safest in Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ontario's mining community will be pleased to know that the government is making the health and safety of Ontario's miners such an important priority. I understand that the Mining Workplace Health and Safety Conference based much of their discussion around the report and its recommendations, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, that the announcement was well received by all of the stakeholders, particularly in my community of Sudbury. Speaker, through you back to the Minister of Labour, can the minister please outline some of the things people are saying in reaction to the Mining Health, Safety and Prevention Advisory Group's final report? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. The honourable member is absolutely correct. The report, based on the work of the people that did it, is receiving praise from right across the mining sector, employers and, and uh, labour groups alike. Let me give you some of the quotes. This comes from Wendy Fram, the mother of a young man who was tragically killed. Um, in a mining accident. She says, I am pleased that the government has listened to the mining community, is taking positive action to make Ontario's underground mines safer. John Perkwin for the United Steelworkers, Speaker. The health and the lives of thousands of women and men who work in the mining industry in Ontario are dependent upon the improvements that are being recommended. Chris Hodgson from the Ontario Mining Association itself. These recommendations bring us closer to the goal we all share of zero harm in the workplace. We believe the recommendations that are being put forward in this report will assist Ballet and all companies within Ontario's mining sector in becoming safer places to Answer. work. That comes from Andy Robson from Ballet. Speaker, these are just a few examples of what's being said about this excellent review based on Thank the hard you. work of everybody in Ontario's mining Thank sector. You. Question the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment and Climate Change this morning. Minister, on Monday, the Ontario Court of Appeals ruled against your ministry and in favour of the Prince Edward County field naturalists in their quest to keep an industrial wind turbine factory from destroying the delicate ecosystem on the south shore of Prince Edward County. The opinion by the court stated that the Environmental Review Tribunal was correct in using expert evidence that showed the project would result in serious and irreversible harm to the ecosystem when it refused to grant approval to this project back in 2013. Minister, will you do the right thing in this case? Will you save the Blanding turtle? Will you protect the environment in Prince Edward County? Will you prevent your ministry from wasting further taxpayer resources by refusing to join any more appeals Order. launched by the developer, Ostrander Point GP Incorporated? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I love blanding turtles, and I was very pleased that. Uh, and I want to commend the people uh, of your constituency uh, um, for for their activism. And we have a very good process of environmental assessment and a court process uh, with our with our environmental bill of rights. It's one of the best in the world, and this minister respects that and should think the people the people should come out ahead in these processes mr speaker i cannot comment in detail because of my role and i think the member knows the restrictions that i have i, I will go one further though because this is something that's important to me i would be quite happy to meet with you uh, because i think we have larger issues of biodiversity loss with climate change uh, and we have challenges right now with neurotoxic pesticides that are impacting on amphibians and water and ver vertebrates and, sir? Uh, and and these issues are becoming more acute mr speaker uh, but i would uh, there are some other environmental concerns with other species that I think we both share. Which... Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, this isn't just another uh, community group that's opposing this project, although thank you for commending their efforts in Prince Edward County. Uh, one of the intervening parties that joined the field naturalists in Prince Edward was Nature Canada. Uh, your ministry has known for years that this project would destroy the ecosystem in southern Prince Edward, and you've not only turned a blind eye to the fact, you've actively committed taxpayer resources to helping the developer destroy an ecosystem. Your own experts, Minister, at the Environmental Review Tribunal, the Ontario Court of Appeals and Nature Canada, who, by the way, do believe in wind power, but just not at this particular site, are telling you that this project is environmentally destructive. Will you commit here today that the Ministry of Environment not waste any more taxpayer resources in aiding the developer 
in further appeals for this project, either in court or Question. at the ERT? Will you do that? End taxpayers' involvement and your ministry's involvement. Quit the shell Thank game you. and end this. In Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, the role of the Environment Minister is the end of an adjudicative process with the environmental assessments and other things, and it would prejudice any process for me to comment on that specifically. But but to say that I am not concerned about it would be quite wrong, and I would go further because, as I said earlier, I would describe uh, what we're facing right now on this planet uh, as a biodiversity um, crisis. We are, we are tracking to lose about one-third of our species right now on this planet, and it's very serious. And any, any, You talk to farmers, you talk to folks who have cottages, we are losing species at an unprecedented rate. I cannot talk about the specifics of this, Mr. Speaker, but I, but I do believe the member is sincere in the concern, as is our, his constituents, and I would be happy to meet privately with him to discuss Answer. this, because I do believe that I'm accountable to him and other members, and I wish I could be more forthcoming, but I can't without compromising my position. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pursuant to Standing Order 38A, the member from Leeds Grenville has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer of its question of the Premier concerning the government beer sale plan. This matter will be debated at 6 p.m. on Tuesday. The uh, Minister of Training College University is on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, it is my privilege to welcome my former high school teacher, uh, Mr. Hassan Ali Wahid, accompanied by her granddaughter. <laughs> Nagar Hashemi, who is lawyer, he is a lawyer, and also president of the Iranian Women Organization, and the Mr. Shah Basir, who is in the house. He made him very happy. There, uh, And I don't think he's going to look my way either. <laughs> there are no deferred votes. This house stands recessed until uh, 3, 3 p.m. this afternoon. No, this afternoon. 1 p.m. this afternoon.